in this world that is absolutely certain. Even the appointment that we may imagine that we all have with death is not certain because the Lord might return. And, uh, and if we're certain that actually we're going to die before the Lord returns, um, then really we've been presumptuous and, and we're not going to be ready for his return. And so, the, if, so we could say the only certainty is that the Lord Jesus will return, that he will judge the world in righteousness, and, uh, and that he will, if we have trusted in him, give us a place in his eternal kingdom. And if we haven't trusted in him, the Bible teaches very, very clearly that we will be lost for all eternity. And uh, so, how can we be confident? Well, I think if what I've just said is true, if nothing is certain in this world, then it means that all the things that people build their lives on are like that man that Jesus tells the parable about who built his house on the sand. I remember, as a fairly new Christian, I was doing a mission in Glastonbury uh, during the festival there, and speaking to various people. I came across uh, one couple, and as I spoke to them, you know, I was kind of trying to find, you know, what are they insecure about? Uh, because, you know, that's often the way in for the Lord to, to 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 share with them the confidence and the certainty that they can have. But they seemed absolutely confident, they were very happy in the world, they had everything they needed, they didn't feel they needed anything whatsoever. And so many people are like that, aren't they? Their whole, they seem to have everything, and they felt no need of the Lord. And they said to me, you know, for you, your faith is just a crutch. And Christians, that's what they are, they're people who, they're not really very strong in the world, so they have a faith to lean on, because without it, they, they just, they can't get along very well. And I thought about that, and I said to them, as they spoke to me, you know, you two really love one another, don't you? And they did. They did everything together. And I said, well, what if your partner went tomorrow? You know, there's no certainty about life. Your partner could have a heart attack and be gone. How would that affect your life then? And as they thought about that, they realised that their, the foundation of all their happiness, of all their joy, of their whole life was built on one another. And it's not a certain foundation. And, uh, and so, as, do you know, that means as Christians... We should stand out as a confident people in a way that nobody else does. Nobody else has that kind of certainty. Let's uh, have a look. We're going to look at uh, really through the um, uh, through one John, which is a great book and assurance. We'll have the next slide, please. Uh, we're going to read just um, from verses uh, one to verse seven. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So, as we think about those words, we're thinking about the assurance that we have. You see, if we have Christ as Christians are not absolutely confident in our own faith in the Lord, 
then we haven't really got a lot to offer a lost world, have we? If, how can we offer them something that is confident, that they can be secure about, if we ourselves are not secure in our faith? But also, apart from that, it's natural for us to sometimes wonder, do I really belong to the Lord? Have you ever wondered that? I hope you have, because otherwise, the dangers we've taken our salvation for granted. And so it's important to ask that question, do I really belong to the Lord? What is your confidence based on when you think about that? An important lesson, this is such an important lesson to learn in life as a believer. Okay? And it's a mistake that many Christians make. In fact, probably most Christians make this mistake at some point. And maybe this is a mistake that you make. When we try and answer a question like that, like that, how do I know that I belong to the Lord? Often we'll go to the Bible and we'll look at a particular verse and we'll say, ah, that's true for me. Let me give you an example. It says in Romans chapter 10, if, that, if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so we read a verse like that and think, well, I do believe Jesus is Lord and I do believe that God raised him from the dead, therefore I must be saved. But do you know what? I've got news for you. There is no one verse in the Bible that tells us everything that there is to know on a particular subject. Did you know that? It's important that we know that. Because that is not all the Bible says on the matter. In fact, Jesus said this, didn't he? Um, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Did I not do this? Did I not do that? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not heal the sick? And Jesus replied to them, I will say to you, I never knew away from me. So that shows us that we can't just take a verse from the Bible and think, that's it, I'm secure. Yeah? We have to look at all that the Bible has to say on those subjects. And uh, if ever you're unsure about, do I really belong to the Lord Jesus? 1 John is the place to go. It's the book on assurance, really. Of all the books of the Bible, it is really all about our assurance, how we can know that we belong to the Lord. So, if we can have our next slide. In 1 John, we read these, these words, don't we? Chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So he's writing 1 John so that believers might know that they have eternal life. And if he's writing the letter so that believers might know that they have eternal life, then that means that sometimes believers don't know. And it means that sometimes believers base their confidence on things that aren't correct. Therefore, he writes so that they can know what to base their confidence on. Am I being clear? Yeah. Good. Let's have the next verse. We'll look at a few verses, the next slide. Um, because throughout 1 John, he, he says these things. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. So again, he's saying that, you know, how can we know that we know him? Well, if we obey his commands. Therefore, again going back to John 10, uh, Romans chapter 10, it's not just, do I say that he is Lord? There's something else added here. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. 1 John chapter 2 verse 5, if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Can we have the next slide? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. So you can see, can't you, that he's building a kind of a case a number of different things here. And the next slide, please. 
Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know. No, this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us or he has given us. But then, even when he says that, there comes a warning. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. So even, um, even that, he says, we need to test it. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Incidentally, I don't believe that he's saying test every prophecy. What he's saying there is that there were people among the people of God who were false prophets and they've now gone out into the world. That's what they end up doing. So, one job is a book on assurance. If ever you're not sure, do I really belong to the Lord? Meditate on one job. Get into it. Get to grips with it. We're going to try and do our best to do something of that this morning. So, it seems that John is writing one job because something has been happening in the church that has caused believers to wonder, do I really belong to the Lord? We have our next slide, please. And uh, here we can see what the issue is. John is writing about people that have been part of the church. He says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. It seems that they've had a number of people who they, everyone thought, I thought that was a brother. You know, a, a real man of God. And they've gone. And people are left thinking, well maybe, maybe I don't really belong to the Lord. You know, a bit like when Jesus was with the disciples gathered in the uh, upper room sharing that last meal. And he says to them, one of you will betray me. And what did all, every single one of the disciples do? Suddenly doubt fills their own hearts. Lord, is it I? They're lacking assurance. They don't know. They're not sure. Maybe, and maybe, maybe you can think that. Am I going to go the distance? Do I really belong to the Lord? Can we have the next <coughs> slide? Because there is such a thing as counterfeit Christians. That's what these people were. They, they were among the people of God, but they went out. Those that Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. They were counterfeit. They weren't really Christians. Now, now here's the scary thing. The scary thing is this. They probably thought they were. They probably thought, yeah, I must be a believer. Here's what so many of us do. And this is a rocky foundation because in none of these verses... And in, in, in 1 John, this is not given as a foundation of our faith. Now this is, this is what we do. I must be a believer because I remember I gave my life to the Lord Jesus and had a wonderful feeling. And, and we build our assurance on something that happened sometimes many years ago. The Bible doesn't say that that's assurance. The Bible doesn't say that you know you belong to the Lord if you had an experience or you, or you just gave your life to the Lord Jesus in 1974 or whenever it may have been. And that means this, if you're building your confidence on that, it's like you're building your confidence on something that God never gave to you as confidence for your salvation. So there are counterfeit Christians. So I want to ask you, do you ever wonder, do I really belong to the Lord? Do you ever wonder that? Do you ever, in your heart, think, is, is this all true? Are you, are you confident about that? I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I get plagued with doubt. Okay? I... I I, and here's the reason why. I sometimes think, am, am I a counterfeit? 
Di different people doubt for different reasons. And uh, one of the reasons uh, is that, you know, they, they wonder, is this whole Christianity thing true? Okay, sometimes people think that. Is it really true? Am I in the right religion? Is God really up there? Did Jesus really live and die and rise again? Is my relationship, is it real? Is, is all this real or have I made a mistake? And very often what people do to answer that question, they look around in the church and they see someone who they trust and they think, well, he believes it must be true. <laughs> it's true, it's what people do. If it wasn't true, surely they would, they would know. And often that is why we come unstuck, because sometimes those very people are the ones that forsake the Lord and go into the world. As a new believer, I remember <coughs> the first church, I, was a, I wasn't a member of it, I, I, I attended it regularly, a good-sized church. I remember the pastor there. I mean, this is a terrible thing, and I'm not, you know, not going to mention any names, but when it came to like that he'd been having an affair <coughs> with a young girl, that had their family had taken in a vulnerable girl. Two years. Great preacher. Every, you know, two years listening to his ministry. He'd been having an affair the whole time. And then, you know. And I remember that shook my faith. If we're putting our confidence in other people, then we're on very shaky foundations. I honestly just don't do that. Now for me, I... What, what, it doesn't cause me to doubt the, the question of, is it all true? Okay, maybe that's a question for you. And in 1 John, in those opening verses, I did underline them. Uh, uh, if we, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it, we'll go back to them. But he begins 1 John, if you've got your Bible in front of you, you'll see, by, un, by underlining that the Lord Jesus, this is the one who we've seen, we've touched, we've been in his presence, the one that we, we were with, we proclaimed, and he's given empirical evidence about the Lord Jesus. Yeah? He's saying, you know, this, it wasn't, this isn't just, a, I didn't have a dream, this isn't a vision that I'm telling you about. This is the Lord Jesus. We lived with him, we touched him, and this is the one that we proclaim to you. And the resurrection of Jesus has empirical evidence that we can look at. And so I don't actually doubt that Christianity is true. I don't know about you, maybe you do it some, some, you know, now and then. In that case, look at the evidence. I love it. You know, that's one of the things that I love about the Christian faith. God has kind of nailed it. He's absolutely, he's nailed it. And so we can have real confidence about that. And people lack confidence, often because they haven't looked at the evidence. Remember John the Baptist? He started doubting, didn't he? And he sent one of his men to Jesus and said, Are you the one that we should expect? And what did Jesus answer? Tell him what you see. The blind receive their sight. The deaf hear, the lame walk. And what he's doing there is he's given kind of empirical evidence. This is things that people have seen and that they can see. And, uh, and so we have the equivalent in many ways for the resurrection. I'll tell you why I doubt that. Not because of that. I'm, I'm very confident that Jesus really rose from the grave. Praise God. Yes. I doubt whether I'm a real Christian sometimes. You know, I, I'll tell you why. I feel like a fake. And a fraud sometimes. Especially preaching. Telling people, preaching the word, and I think to myself, is that really true for me though? I have to preach it because I'm not going <coughs> to water it down. You know, I'm not going to change it. Be but, but I ask, you know, do I really love people the way the Lord says I should? Am I, am I really holy? And I, when I look at my life, I think, I'm not. I'm not. I keep, I keep doing things and messing up and... Running out of grace for people. My relationship with the Lord. If you are anything like me, okay, then every single day, you don't get your face in the Bible and stir your heart with his word. And, and work to stir your affections towards the Lord Jesus and meditate on him. If every day you don't do that, you grow cold. That's what I do. Just calm in the world. Start loving the world. I find it easy to love the world. I find it easy to love the things of the world. Get excited about cars or gadgets or a TV <laughs> program or something like that, science and all sorts of things. Easy to love the world. But I find it really hard to continually love the Lord Jesus. 
Yeah. And so I, I find myself, am I really a believer? Or maybe, am I one of the counterfeits? Yeah, you know, this should concern us sometimes. Now, I don't want to undermine your faith, because John writes these so that we can have confidence. But it's important for us to be honest about the way that we are and, the, and about our own experience. And, and you know, I think it, that, you know, what, uh, John wrote, wrote this letter because he knew that genuine believers would struggle. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we all fall short of the glory of God. And you know what? If this morning you are so cocksure that you belong to the Lord, then you really need to humble yourself and get your confidence from God's Word. So that's what we're doing. So they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Next slide, please. When my heart causes me to doubt, this is what I turn to, 1 John chapter 3, verse 19. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts. You see that? You see, my heart will condemn me. My heart will tell me, Julian, you're not really a believer. You, yeah, you're a fake and you're a fraud and Jesus doesn't, you, you've not quite got into the kingdom. You're one of those that, that you know, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus tells that. If you don't know that parable, you need to look it up. But he says, that, tells a parable about the wheat, the wheat and the tares in God's field that, you know, God has planted his seed and the seed's springing up. But then an enemy comes and sows some tares. Now the tares look very much like the wheat. And I think, and my heart will tell me, Julian, you're one of the tares. And wants to undermine my faith. We have an enemy in the world that also would like us to believe that. Take away our confidence. He'd be very happy for us also to build our confidence on the wrong things. So that if we're not actually saved and we think we are, we never get saved. But how do we handle this? We come to God and his word because he is greater than my heart. Whatever my heart tells me, if my heart is saying, Julian, you belong to God, you've got nothing to worry about. Do you know what? I need to go to the word and just check this with the Lord. Is this right? You see? If my heart is telling me, you don't really belong to the Lord, the Lord doesn't really love you. You haven't been serious about really walking the Lord. You know you're a failure, Julian. I have to go to the word because he knows everything. My heart doesn't. You see, so we rely on God and his word. And he has given us his word here in 1 John. Now the problem with counterfeits, if you can have the next slide please. The problem with counterfeits is this. Counterfeits do look very much like the real thing. There's a guy that sells fireworks. He sort of like sets up a, a shack opposite where I live. And he sells fireworks every year. The man's a gangster. Proper gangster. Okay? He really is. And uh, he, he's, like, he's, done, yeah, he's done time and all sorts of stuff. Done loads of scams. And he's well known for it. But anyway, but he's pretty good for buying fireworks. He, he, he does it in a fairly, pretty, it all seems pretty legit anyway. But in our church, every year we have a big fireworks do. We invite unbelievers. And the church all chipped in. So I had a load of bundle of money to go buy some fireworks. So I went to him, 200 quid's worth of fireworks that, that we collected from the church. And, uh, and he said, oh, I can't just take that money. This is a gangster himself. He says, I've got to check it all. And so he gets out all of his gadgets and he's checking the notes. And he said to me, like, I'm a pastor, you know. You come into him and he's a gangster and he's checking my notes. Anyway, he, he said, you know, because you could have been past counterfeit notes, you wouldn't even know it. They look so much like the real thing. He's an expert in this. He said, that, yeah, these are real. The one thing that they can't mimic is the texture. And he knows all about banknotes, this guy. <laughs> so if you need to get some notes checked, tell me. But here's the thing. They, here's the thing, right? Counterfeit notes. What happens is, like, unless you're like me, leading a church, you've probably got a big wedge of money in your pocket. 
you know, big notes, you know, and you go, and you're feeling full of confidence when you go shopping, you pull out your money, you go to pay for your goods, and what happens if it's a counterfeit? You never knew, you was confident that this was going to do the business. And they look at it, and they check it, and they say, sorry, this is a counterfeit note. And then what happens? Well, they don't even give it back, do they? So you can try and spend it somewhere else. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? They take it. They have to destroy it. And what happens is you lost out because it was counterfeit. And counterfeits look like the real thing. And so we've got to be very careful and make sure that our faith is based on the real thing. So that when we get to glory, we don't hand the Lord our guarantee and find that it is a counterfeit. Because on that day, I want to hear the words, well done. Then I'll know that it wasn't counterfeit. Yes. And the alternative is this, depart from me. And we don't want to hear those words. That is going to be true. If what Jesus says is true, and this is a grave truth, and I, you know, I've prayed for you already. If what Jesus says is true, then there are some of you here, right now, will be counterfeit Christians, according to Jesus, the wheat and the tares. The Lord says, you know, the servant says, shall I put up the, 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 the tares, the weeds? And what does the Lord say? No, 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 let them grow together. In other words, in our midst, there be these people. So this, this morning, this is a chance for you to make sure that you're not counterfeit. And if you think you are, you can begin to put it right. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, next slide, please. This is what he says, 1 John chapter 2. He's writing to the church, and some of the people have already gone from the church. Maybe you've had people go from the church into the world. You've known that experience. This is what he says to the people that remain. So this is a word for you, to encourage you. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but... As his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has <coughs> taught you, remain in him. Okay? The next slide should be better, yeah. Remain in him. So we don't want to be counterfeit. We want to be one of those who are guaranteed, who are absolutely confident that we belong to the Lord. Okay? So how do we know that we belong to the Lord? If we can just show the next slide. I've already mentioned about this. There's the empirical evidence, okay? Um, and empirical evidence is valid. In other words, if you're not sure if this is all true, I wanna, we haven't got time to do it now, but I want to suggest to you that you should look up evidence for the resurrection. Get confident about it. Yeah, we live in this world, in this lifetime once. We get three score and ten. And it's up to you what you do with that time. And I'm telling you this. It is a good investment of your time to know the evidence of the resurrection. Amen. It is a worthwhile endeavour. And if you don't know it, you're a Christian, you need, you need to know it so you can tell others. Because there are lots of other people that don't believe the resurrection. So, and we can have absolute confidence in that. We're not <coughs> talking about that this morning. But, so, but there's empirical evidence. The second kind of way that we can know that it's true is the philosophical argument. Now we're not going to look at that. But really what that does is it says that um, we can know that Christianity is true because it makes sense of this world and everything in it, basically. Christianity, I would say, is the only faith that makes sense. And through the philosophical argument, we can deduce that there is a God because you cannot get something from nothing. And this world exists, and we exist. There's got to be a God. But you can't just have a God. It philosophically has got to be the Christian God. And now I'm not going to explain why that is right now. But you can find out, and you should get to know this stuff. If you're, if you want to know a, a good person to, to, um, you can watch his um, his videos on YouTube. A guy called William Lane Craig. You heard of him? No. You heard of Richard Dawkins? Okay, you've heard of Richard Dawkins. He's the atheist, right? This is the guy that Richard Dawkins refuses to debate. This is the guy that, you know, Christopher Hitchens and various others? Yeah, he's debated all these others, and all of them go away with their tail between their legs. 
Okay, he's a great, great philosopher, and he's a Christian. And if you know about Richard Dawkins, you should know about William Lane Craig and hear how he answers Dawkins and the likes of Dawkins. Again, it's an investment that you should make, and it will build your own confidence. But our faith doesn't rest on that. Our faith rests on God's word. The third string of evidence, which is what we're going to close with very quickly, is, is it existentially true, or experimentally true, or <coughs> experientially true, shall I say. In other words, okay, I've heard about it, it all seems to add up, but is it true for me in my own life? You know, in other words, is there kind of integrity between this worldview of Christianity, between the historical evidence for Christianity, but also then my experience? Because, praise God, God has given us all of that. Yeah, we don't just believe in a bubble and think, yeah, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, as long as I don't look at the evidence out there. No, we can have, this is the confidence that we have. It's true in here, it's true out there. It's a wonderful, glorious truth, and we should know it. Um, can we have the next slide, then? I'll try and get through this stuff as quickly as I can, because I can see our time is almost gone. Uh, this is the message that you heard from him and, and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to have fellowship with him who is the light, but we walk in the darkness, we're lying. And so that means we need to know, what does it mean to walk in the light as he is in the light, don't we? We need to know, what does that mean? It's all very well reading it. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, verse 7, we have fellowship with him and one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So if we can have the next slide. That's walking in the light. What does that mean? Okay. I'm going to just read off a... A few verses, there's, there's plenty, loads more in 1 John, and if you read 1 John, you'll find loads of this stuff. But what does it mean to walk in the light? It means to obey the Lord. 1 John, chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not obey what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You see that? Walking in the light means obeying his commands. So you can ask yourself, do I obey his commands? But you know, there's more that we need to know. Um, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 10. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself. That's obedience again, isn't it? Everyone who sins breaks the law. What, is sin? what, is, what does it mean to sin? It means to break the law of God, to disobey his commands. Verse 5, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse 7, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous, and he who does what is sinful is of the devil. That's harsh words, isn't it? So he's saying that if we belong to the Lord, we will purify ourselves. We will not sin. We will not continue to sin. Now that should cause some questions for you. How many of you sinned at some point this morning in some way? I did. All of us do. So what, do we, what does that mean? Because it also says in 1 John, doesn't it, verses 8 and 9, if we claim to be without sin, we make him out to be a liar and the truth is not in us. Yeah. Unbelievers sin, counterfeit Christians sin, Christians sin. But it says here, we don't continue to sin. What does it mean? What does it mean to obey his commands? Well, we'll come to it in just a moment. Um, there's some other verses I could read to bear that out, but I'm going to assume that you'll take me at my word that it says we're to obey his commands, okay? But here's the question that that raises. Are we, we're not under law, though, are we? 
Yeah? Is that true? We are not under law. So what is it that we obey? What is the law? If we're true believers, that we obey. Can we have the next slide? We obey the royal command. All the commands, Jesus says, are fulfilled in this. Um, Jesus said, didn't he? If you love me, you obey my commands. And he said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by the love you have one for another. And in this, all the law and the prophets are summed up. That if we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our minds, all our strength, all our soul, and love our neighbour as ourselves. So all the commands are summed up in this command to love one another, our brothers primarily, first. And that's what is born out in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 11. We'll just zip through a couple of these. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one. So what, what was this command? What is this law, this rule that we are to obey? Which you have heard since the beginning. This old command is the message that you have heard. Yet yeah, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, and here it is, but hates his brother is still in the dark. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. There you go. How do we remain in the light? By obeying his command. What's his command? That we love one another. Yes. And as we love one another, we remain in the light. See that? And it simplifies it for us. Yeah, how do I know that I'm a believer? How do I know that I belong to God? Here's the, the shortcut answer. Do you love your brothers and your sisters? There it is. Verse 11. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. He does not where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Incidentally, brothers and sisters, okay? You've got a choice. And this is it. There is no other choice. Love your brother or hate your brother. There's no other choice. There's no love your brother, or you know, you, you get on with him, you accept him, or hate him. The Bible does not speak in those terms. I'll tell you why. Because when you like, tolerate your brother, for example, that is not loving him. Here's what we do when we tolerate people. We see their sin, and we just judge them. Or, we just kind of, you know, oh, I'll ignore that, I'll just carry on. Here's what love does. Love speaks truth. In other words, when we're confronted by someone's sin, we don't just leave them in it. We don't just ignore it or tolerate it. We come alongside because we love them. And we say to them, brother, what you're doing, the way you're acting, your attitude, you need to repent. That's what love does. Do you love your brothers and your sisters? See, when we leave them in their sin, well, that is to passively hate them. Isn't it? If you think about it, to leave someone in their sin is passive hatred. That's why the Bible only speaks in terms of love or hate. And nothing in between. Do you love your brothers? Maybe there's a brother or a sister that you don't love. You tolerate, but you don't love them. Maybe they've upset you. Maybe they're, they're, they're because of their sin. And you've just left them. If you love your brothers and your sisters, you'll go to them because you love them. You're not going to them to dig the knife in. You're not going there for any other reason than that you love them. And you know that the Lord Jesus does not want them to remain in their sin. And the Lord Jesus wants you to come alongside your brothers and your sisters and to love them out of their sin. That's what Jesus does. By grace and truth. Speak the truth in love, it Paul says in Ephesians. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And that's what our ministry is, as believers. I'm coming home to land very quickly. There's a lot more that we could look at about loving our brothers and sisters. Um, I would encourage you to read 1 John. But 
We're told to love our brothers and sisters, and specifically we're also told what not to love. Because to love takes time and energy. You cannot love your brothers and sisters without giving them your time and energy. You cannot love your brothers and sisters without making sacrifices. And so what is the sacrifice that we make? What does 1 John say? 1 John chapter 2 verse 7 tells us what we should not love. Sorry, verse 15. Do not, so we love our brothers and sisters positively, do not love the world or anything in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the sinful craving of the craving of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has, has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but, God, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Do not love the world. So we sacrifice that and the energy and the time that maybe you put into the world, forget it, it's passing. You know, your car and your house and all that, all that's good, it's on its way to the rubbish tip. That's where it's going. Don't love it. It's got a function and purpose, appreciate it. But don't so love that that you neglect your brothers and your sisters. Make space for loving your brothers and your sisters. So, just a question or two to reflect on. How do I know that I belong to the Lord? Do you really love your brothers and your sisters? Why does God put the emphasis on loving our brothers and our sisters? You know, I'll tell you why. He could have said, you know, love the Lord your God, as, as the scriptures say. But I've met many people that will say this to me. I used to go to church. I still love God, but I just don't love the church. You ever met people like that? But this says, if you don't love God's people, you do not love God. That's, that's where the rubber hits the road. If you really love God, you love God's people. And what this says to me is, well, Lord, I don't know if I do really love God's people. And that's the whole point, you see. Here's what God's wanting to do with you this morning. To see your weakness, to see how faint your love is for your brothers and sisters, to see your own failings. And what should that do? Cause us to fly to the Lord and say, Lord, give me love for my brothers and my sisters. Fill me with your grace so that I can love as you love. And that's the whole thing. And it's in that kind of relationship we have absolute confidence. Because he's given us love to love one another. So how do we know that we belong to the Lord? We love one another. Um, there are a couple of other things. Other assurances which I've not mentioned. Um, but they count as well. Like his spirit in us. And uh, one or two others. But certainly that is a good one. Let's pray.